Well, welcome to the programme. We're down here at Philip Hall, the home of Selkirk Rugby Club, with uh, former captain Ross Nixon and also the head coach, Scott White, and Dale Clancy, who's uh, with us as ever as well. We'll start with, uh, with you, Scott. A big game for you on Saturday. Of course, it's our featured commentary match. It's against Curry. Many people's favourites to win the title. Yeah, I mean, it's um, certainly coming up the back of a defeat as well last week from Hoyk. You know, there's a huge amount of focus on this week. Um, look, we know how tar hard it's going to be. Um, you look at their team on paper, and as you say, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are backing them to win the league, but... You know, we'll see how we go. A year and a half ago, they came down here and we turned them over. So, I mean, they're not going to get it easy. Um, we'll make it really hard for them. Um, and, you know, that's one thing that we've had a main focus on this year. Let's be hard to beat. So, you know, it's up to us. If we turn up, I believe we're, you know, we're good enough to beat anybody on our day. But as we've seen last Saturday, we've got to turn up and perform. How much respect do you give uh, a team like Curry, who obviously have, have scored a couple of really big wins? Because we always hear this phrase, oh, we give them too much respect. But how much respect do you give them? When they come with players that have played in a professional game, you know, you've got you to realise who they are. Obviously, Gregor's played. Gregor Hunter kind of controls the strings up there at 10, you know, so he has a huge influence. But as you say, I think if you give these guys too much respect, you're literally just telling them to run the game for 80 minutes. And... If you do that, I think you'll get beat. Um, so, you know, there's a fine balance. Yes, you've got to probably respect the individual and what he's achieved, but, you know, you've also got to give it to him because if you let him sit back in the pocket and control things, you know, we'll never be out of half in the rugby. So, you know, it comes with uh, a fair bit of responsibility from ourselves and we've got to front up and, you know, we've not got... You give them the respect, but you don't. Um, it's a hard one. What about you, uh, Dale, on that? I mean, it, on paper, this looks as if it's going to be the match of the day. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's been quite true for all the games in the, in the Premiership so far. I think, you, you know, the, you try and predict who's going to be the winner, but they've all, every single team in that league's been defeated so far. So I think it's early days in the league and trying to predict who, who's going to win is, is, you know, it's taken a bit of time for the, the, the clubs to feel each other out. Hoik have beat Curry. Hoik then beats Selkirk. So, you know, there's... there's and then Hoyk have been beaten as well so there's nothing to say that Selkirk on their own patch can't turn over Curry. I think it is early days but in terms of the respect side of things I think coming down to the borders for City teams has always been really really difficult and especially coming to somewhere like Selkirk I think sometimes are maybe a little bit of disservice in terms that they've been really really successful in the last couple of decades especially in the border scene but playing towards the kind of topper end of, of Scottish rugby and it's a difficult one for them to, to, to take on because the Curry have came off the back of a good win as well. But I, I feel Selkirk, you know, if they can get, their, get a good gel in the team for, for the weekend, they could, they could turn them over and, and probably on paper get an upset. But it would maybe give them a platform for the rest of the season as well. We hear about fortresses and things like that. Melanie Park is a big fortress, there's no doubt about that. Over the years, Curry have been tremendous at home. But they have had their, their, their niggles away from home. Yeah, I think all teams, I think during a, a, a league campaign, you've got to be able to travel well as well you know you can't just have good home form and then go on the road and, and you know narrow defeats and, and be intimidated away from home but certainly it's, it's a marathon and Selkirk are aware of that, Curry are aware of that, Hoyk you know all these teams that are looking to try and real stamp authority in this league which no real team has done yet, nobody's really set down a marker and said we're going to be the team to beat they all need to be able to perform home and away to, to really to, you know to steal the title well, Ross, let's bring you in here at this point because uh, you have been playing for Selkirk a while and you've had a few curry tussles in the past and uh, I do remember there was, a, there was quite a frightening uh, result at one point, so 80 odd points. Uh, were you, you obviously not playing on that one, were you? I uh, was playing on that Oh, one, you were yeah. playing in it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was uh, when we were back in the old Prem 1. And, uh, I think in that game we had like the full five professionals allocated from the Edinburgh side and uh, yeah, it didn't work very well for us. I think we got a red card in that game and the... Uh, been up there twice as well, and we've lost 80 odd points, and then again 70 odd to nil as well. But uh, things change, and uh, they're coming down here off the back of that big wing last week. But as I say, it's a week match for them. I think we're comfortable down here. We'll, uh, we'll definitely get a good run for the money. Like. They lost that first game of the season, I think, and uh, we're looking towards just really getting stuck in about the boys because we've played them all before. There's not many new faces, and we know what they're about, and it's just if we can gel best in the day. I think that's been a big issue just now with all the games that have been going on. It's, uh, it's been that long off where we've just need teams to kind of get back into the stride of things and we've had some old people disappear and new faces come in. It's just to uh, find your feet again. Isn't it? 
Now, of course, you mentioned the player draft, and, and the player draft isn't there anymore because obviously Super Six has come in since then, and and that doesn't really affect the Premiership, which is a good thing, I think. It's more of a level playing field, and as uh, Dale said, you know, every club so far, just after two games, has lost a match. Yeah, they have, and uh, it means teams have to trust themselves and trust uh, within themselves their own kind of development programs and whatnot. We've got a lot of young boys down here from Selkirk and can we brought some fresh faces in as you have to because we're not a big area and there's positions we can't fill ourselves within town. But the young boys we have got here, they're keen, they're enthusiastic, they're, they're cracking players and it's just to uh, get everybody to gel together and play as one. Like. Well, Dale, let's have a quick look at the fixtures from the weekend and we'll start with the Southern Knights uh, win over Watsonians, which stretches their lead at the top of the Super 6 table. And they're running out of games now, which is a good thing for Southern Knights, but of course, they're still getting the playoffs uh, sorted out and Ayrshire Bulls coming up on the rails. Yeah, Ayr got a good win as well, put a bit of pressure on, but I was speaking to Nicky Walker after the, during the week as well and he just said Southern Knights played better than them. They, they've got a few injury issues at Watsonians, but... Again, it's like, you know what we've been saying there, you, you play who's in front of you. Um, you've got to front up to the opposition and Southern Knights getting a good win. And as you say, running out of games, really putting a marker down to, for, you know, being one of the one of the kind of finalists there when it's coming to the business end of the tournament. So the Southern Knights have, have certainly found a really good bit of consistency, a little blip on the road with a, with a defeat that they've had this season. But overall, they've, they've been pretty consistent, picking up some good wins. It's maybe you know, showing a lot of their forward grunt as well. They're formidable up front, and I think a lot of teams are finding that hard to deal with. Four penalty tries, I think, and for, you know, we keep seeing it's either Russell, An uh, Russell Anderson or it's Fraser Rennick at the back of the, the driving mall, and uh, there they go. I mean, they've really perfected it, haven't they? Yeah, and I think you see that a lot in kind of world rugby now. A lot of, a lot of teams are really targeting that driving mall again. It kind of went out of fashion. It's, it certainly came back in. Um, but if, if, you've got a, if you've got a recipe for, you know, for scoring tries and stick to it and keep going and that seems like the Southern Knights have been doing they've certainly found the, the formula and they're certainly scoring a lot of tries to their hookers and obviously for manipulating the, the forwards from the, from the line-out Now Scott, um, you know Rob Christie very well of course having played with, with him back in the, the day and you've uh, coached with him as well and, uh, and of course Selkirk have been down a couple of times with the Southern Knights which has been very helpful for both sides yeah, I think it's, you know, utilising what's on your doorstep. Uh, you know, we struggle to get to that tempo and that intensity of training. And if we can get that exposure through the week, you know, we found that then that only benefits us on the Saturdays. Um, so, I mean, we, we use it, you know, not uh, probably not as much as we had liked. We had planned to go across there on Tuesday night, but off the back of, you know, a few injuries at Hoik at the weekend and trying to see physios and doctors and who's going to be available for this week to then who do we pull up from the seconds. We felt it would be better this week to just have everything under the one roof. So we train, decided to train here on Tuesday night. But, you know, it's a great tool. It's on our doorstep and, you know, why wouldn't we use it? And I think it's fair to say Rob is trying to engage with all the, the local clubs. And as he rightly says, you know, it, Southern Knights isn't for everybody. But for those who do want to go, people like Dalton Redpath, Andrew Mitchell, Fraser Rennick, all going from Hoyk and other, other people as well. You know, they, it's, uh, the, uh, there's an opportunity there if they want it. Look, I think, you know, we've got to understand now in the borders that's the, way it want, that's the way it goes. And as Ross says, we've got a lot of young guys here that are probably capable of making that next step. And the reality is, if they're wanting to play professional rugby now, that's how it works. And, you know, you can look at somebody like Daniel Sudden as well, Stuart. You know, he's signed from Hoyk there in the summer. He was on the bench for Edinburgh last week. So, you know, he's all of a sudden went from a Hoyk player to a Southern Knights player. And within one season, he's then getting picked up by Edinburgh. So it shows you that there's a real kind of ladder there for young aspiring people to, you know, that's the way it's going. You know, essentially you're playing in Super 6. You're then getting picked up by Edinburgh or Glasgow to then further your career again. So, you know, the reality is that's our, well, that's my job here at Selkirk. You know, how many people at the end of the season is Bob going to sign? Is he going to sign any? You know, I don't know. But for me as a coach, that's how we should be defined in terms of these young guys stepping up to the next level. And that's certainly the way it's going. Well, that's Southern Knights. Let's go into the Premiership then. And uh, obviously, let's start with the, the, the Hoyt game. 23-22 to them. Talking to you afterwards, you were absolutely gutted. I know that. Um, <laughs> Hoyt seemed to be having the game to themselves. And then a couple of uh, breakaway tries, interceptions, and all of a sudden, you were in front 22-20. Uh, and then up pops Mr. Kirk Ford and uh, nails a beautiful penalty, 23 points to 22. But I don't suppose you saw it as a, a beautiful penalty no, from where you were. Certainly not. Um, but... 
You know, we're never really, well, we say we're never really in the game. We watched it last night, you know, probably had enough possession in the first half to win the game four times over, but it was a lack of probably killer instinct in the finishing third, um, you know, and not converting the pressure into points early on. And, you know, credit to the boys, they dug in, they stayed on their tails, you know, and they got rewarded, but, you know, by two late tries. So, I mean, the fighting spirit is there in the team, you know, they want to fight to the end, you know, you know, as you say, there's never a lost cause. You know, so the boys dug deep to get back into the game when we were probably struggling for momentum in the second half. And, you know, we scored and go 22-20 up with three minutes to play. We could have nicked it, but, you know, unfortunately we couldn't hold out. But, you know, when we're looking at the disjointed pre-season and the consistency of selection and injuries at the moment, you know, if somebody said you're going to be on six points after two games, you'd, you'd have probably taken it. Um, you know, so then it's all about coming back home, building momentum again and getting stuck in a curry this weekend. OK, also in the Premiership, it was uh, Jed Forrest against Glasgow Hawks and Jed Forrest very close to uh, getting their first win of the season. There was a late try which was disallowed for a forward pass, which they were obviously disappointed about. But uh, it's certainly an improvement, a step up from the Edinburgh Rackies game. Yeah, it's a step up. It's in, as you say, it's an improvement, but ultimately it's still a defeat. And these small margins sometimes can define your season. And, and you look at the league table and Jed obviously towards the bottom of that Obviously, they've played a game less as well because of um, the COVID issues. But you know, it's disappointing for them to be so close to winning that game and, and coming up short. And, and that's something that you need to try and rectify quite quickly in you know in, in that level of rugby up at the Premiership because one loss, two losses can soon become a you know maybe ten in a row, and you're, you're really fighting against a you know fighting against a tide of, of defeats. And it takes a while to get the confidence back and get you know the confidence into the team, the morale, the culture back. So Jed will be hoping to really try and you know, rectify that quite quickly, but unfortunate for them to lose out to such a fine margin. You mentioned COVID. How much of an impact has that had on players? Now, obviously, Jed Forrest has, has been impacted by it, uh, Selkirk as well, Berwick, other clubs as well. Um, in fact, it's, it's a good time to bring Ross back in here on, on that one because, obviously, um, back at the Sevens in, in August, uh, you had to give up playing at Hoyk because uh, that was in the camp. But once you come back again, it's still in the system of Effectively, and that must have an effect on on the field of play. Well, one person had it, like, and he a week or two, like, uh, just took a while to build back up to where he was. But uh, I think it depends individually as well. Like, some people are not affected too bad with it. Other guys are taking late ages, like. But the guy we had, like, it took maybe a couple of weeks, but up to speed again, yeah. OK, well, Dale International 1 we go, and uh, Melrose sitting near the top of the table. I think it's just points difference now with uh, Bigger at the top, I think, I'm right in saying, um, and obviously Air undefeated as well. But uh, they've got off to a great start. They, they weren't happy about their performance against Boromir. Uh, they were down at half-time against Dundee Rugby at the break, but they certainly pulled away after that, and, and they're going well. Yeah, I've been really impressed with the way that Melrose have started their season. Some, you know, certainly one really big win against Boromir, but they've been starting to feel or the, you know, the, the faces that we've been more used to that aren't in the Southern Knights now, but the faces that we're more used to, like say, um, Richard Ferguson, David Colvin was playing for, you know, the Melrose Storm at the weekend up in Peebles, and we've got these players still to come back, and you look at the depth that they've got now at their club, like I think everybody was worried about, you know, what happened when Southern Knights came along, what would happen to Melrose, would it dilute it, but they've, it seems like they've kind of galvanised themselves again, and they've got a really good cohort of players, and a really good solid start and I was just looking at the depth of their squad, it's bit, we've spoke about it before at nine, but the depth throughout their squad a lot of young players coming through as well James Brown on the wing, you know, scoring tries and looking good, so they've got they've certainly got a good nucleus of, of people there seem to have a good culture which I think's probably helped with having some of the old heads Ferguson and Colvins um, you know, Gav Wood, those sort of players coming about so yeah, the great start to the season, and, but they would want to push on bigger or well suited, you know, to try and make amends for them not going up pre-Covid, so that it's certainly going to be a big battle on their hands. Gala Kelso is where we were last Saturday. Uh, interesting game, 19-0 to Gala, and then uh, back came Kelso to within five points, and then a peach of a penalty from Craig Dodds, curling it over and uh, breaking Kelso hearts there because they ended up with nothing, not even a losing bonus point for that one. And that's, uh, that's after 15 years of, of heartache for them uh, at Netherdale. Yeah, I, th I think to be honest with you, I think Kelso were f almost fortunate to get back into the game. Gallic had really had that sewn up in the first half. They were a little bit more accurate. They had a couple, two visits to the 22 and they scored on two occasions. So they were more clinical in the first half. 
there was a lot, a lot of mistakes. It was quite sloppy rugby in the first half in terms of it was a dry day, but there was a lot of knock-ons. The line-out for both teams was really, really poor. The second half, it seemed to become a bit more of an open game, which was good. It kind of, for the neutral, looked a little bit better. The ball was being, you know, handled a little bit better. The line-out was more accurate and there was a little bit more continuity in the play. Kelsey done well to try and get back in. Bruce McNeil, great run, great influence on the game as well. The, the, just the small, nitty-gritty bits that he was kind of putting into that Kelso team. But ultimately, yeah, a good, a good penalty from, from Craig Dodds. But Gallo made hard work of it. Probably the game should have been put to bed in the first half. But typical Kelso, they claw in, they're dogged, they're resolute. And they, they made a game of it in the second half. But Gallo, you know, they're, speaking after as well, I think they were glad that they, they, they made Kelso leave with nothing, especially after a good start to the season for them. National 2-3, and three, Peebles, your club, of course, uh, or ex-club, um, did uh, pretty well. They went to Preston Lodge, hard place to go, 12-7, I think it was. Uh, so they got the, the four points there. And in Division 3, Berwick won the try count 2 nothing, but lost the game with four penalties going to Murrayfield Wanderers. So, um, again, they'll just be pleased to, to at least get back playing rugby again, and uh, that'll be a result they'll learn from. Yeah, I think Peebles, again, they're, they're struggling with some injury issues of their own up front. Certainly Greg Rayburn's not back as well, who's, who, as we, as we spoke about before, is quite instrumental to what Peebles do, and, and, and he's been a big miss. But to be fair, since they've lost him, they've done quite well. You know, they've, they've beat Stu Mel. Preston Lodge on the road's always quite difficult for them, so it's a good win for them. And, you know, Berwick, it's sometimes one of those games you can be the most attacking team, but if if you're not disciplined and you don't hold your line or you're giving away cheap penalties, sometimes just the way that the ref interprets the game, it can ultimately lead to you losing the game. So they were unfortunate to, to be on the losing side of that, but they'll be glad that they've got the, the attacking options there, but just glad to be playing rugby. But I think all the players, all the teams are fortunate to be out playing rugby considering what we were like the last 18 months. But, you know, they'll be wanting to try and get some more wins under their belt because they're, uh, you know, they're blown a bit hot and cold at the moment. Briefly into the East League, Dunn's got a bit of a tanking at uh, Ross High, I'm afraid. Uh, so they, that'll be a game they'll, they'll want to forget in, in East League 1. Uh, East League 2, again, Langham um, keeping their unbeaten record. It was a close-knit thing at Pennycook, 24-all. And it's interesting because the week before, Pennycook beat Hoytlandine by one point. And now, of course, uh, the two of them uh, will be meeting in the only local derby this weekend. And we'll talk more about that uh, very, very shortly. But good to see Langham getting a good start. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a, a big year for them as we've, as we've discussed with their, their celebrations coming on, so it's, it's good. It's, I mean, Pennycook is always a... It's a horrible place to go, actually, even if, if you're not playing rugby, but it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a difficult place to play. The crowd are, are quite close to you. You know, it's, it's, it's volatile. They're quite a, nice, a well-supported club. They've got a good culture there. Um, so to go a, a long journey for, for Langham to go there and, and get a draw and, and maintain a, a good start to the season is great for them. So they'll be want to try and keep building on that. And, you know, we've said before, win in, and when you're not getting beat, it, it, it's, a, it's a habit that they create. So they'll be hoping that that can continue. And Hoyt Lindeen uh, losing at home to Trinity Aki's, my old school, of course. I have a very soft spot for them. If uh, they're going to lose to anyone, might as well be to Trinity as well. But they'll be disappointed with that one, particularly with Langham just round the corner. Yeah, especially you know, off the back of a tight loss. Sometimes these tight defeats can, can culminate in you really losing the kind, of, like, the kind of control of your ship for the season. So as we said about the Jed, uh, about Jed and the Prem, so you know, they'll be disappointed with that defeat. And, but it's one of those games coming up now, you know, playing a border derby. A form goes out the window. It doesn't really matter how you've been playing or, or what's been happening. It's, it's gloves off and it's just whoever's better on the day between the two teams. And then, of course, we had the third border derby in the East League 3 at the Hawk. It was Orson against Gallo IM. A feisty affair. What a surprise. We didn't expect that, did we? And a win for Gallo IM. Yeah, I think going into that as well, I think form, Gallo IM again, they were, they were speaking before about um, Chappie had actually retired and I see that he was actually playing again, so he's unretired now. <laughs> so he'll probably be retiring soon again. But, you know, it's, Gallo IM probably had the best form going into that, Erlston, as, we, as they discussed when we'd, we'd done this a few weeks ago. They're, you know, struggling to get some players down and get that continuity of the squad. And, you know, sometimes if you're just trying to clutch to get a team, it's going to be difficult against a team like Gallo IM, who have an abundance of numbers at the moment. So certainly that, that game probably went to form. But it's, again, it was a, a feisty border derby, which, is, which we love to see. And finally, we must mention Kelso Ladies getting a win in what just their second game in the National One League. And uh, that's a, a big step up for them. Coming back from 14-0 down, winning 30 points to 14, scoring six tries. Yeah, we did say it last week it was just they were looking forward to actually just playing at Pointer Park and 
getting their first game underway in the in the uh, in the league, and it was great. We thought Air were probably one of those opponents that they could probably turn over, and it was exactly exactly that way. So then it's you know they've they've met their first target, they've got their first home game under under their belt, so they can, and then they've got their first win. It's then building blocks after that to try and get a bit of consistency and try and be reasonably competitive in that league. Well, we'll have a little break there because we're going to bring in uh, David Cowan, who is uh, a gentleman who has uh, had a bit of a hard time during COVID, but uh, regrouped, started up his uh, uh, performance business. It's done incredibly well. And we caught up with him down at Hoik at uh, Mansfield Park. And uh, he told us the story. Uh, so basically, uh, during the pandemic, I was kind of one of these people who were struggling when it came to being able to make an income. Um, having worked in the, the Scottish Rugby Academy, uh, I kind of knew that there was a sort of a void for amateur rugby players when it comes to their strength and conditioning. Obviously the Hoyt boys are lucky enough that they've got me down here, but um, I knew that some of the other clubs weren't, weren't quite as lucky, so that was where uh, Reaver Performance I started up as a, an online strength and conditioning company, um, which is able to provide coaching for players. So I've been lucky enough to work with players from East 3 right up to Super 6, uh, so I've been really impressed with, with kind of the take up from players all over Scotland. So it's all gone so well, and that's one year ago now. I mean, does it, does it seem like one year? Uh, no, it's been a quick year, to be fair. Sorry, I'm just watching, I don't get knocked over here. It's been a, a quick year. Um, it's been really busy, just kind of getting used to doing things more from a business side, as well as just the coaching, which I'm used to. Um, so, yeah, it's been a lot to kind of get used to. Yeah. And, I mean, certainly, I mean, looking at it, you know, one year ago to, to where you are at the moment, um, I mean... You're just not looking back now? No, um, it's definitely something I'm going to carry on. So there's uh, 54 guys working uh, with me in Reaver Performance just now. Uh, so that's down in England as well as in Scotland, but the majority are kind of based in Scotland. And uh, like I say, it's across all levels. So it's really, it's really exciting to get that opportunity to work with different players and uh, to help them. Because if someone wants to make the most of their rugby career, whatever level, I want to be able to help them do that. So. And of course, you're taking all the the qualifications. I've noticed in the past year there's been quite a few uh, yeah. things to add to the uh, to, to the whole business and, and to your own personal development. Yeah. So uh, finished my degree. So that was six years of uh, home study with family and kids. So that was that was hard going, uh, but we got there. And then I've done all my S and my strength and conditioning uh, kind of certificates through the SRU, and uh, just always looking to keep building, keep learning. So yeah. Well, you've got a bit of a reputation of being a hard taskmaster, putting them through the paces, but we're here at Hoyk at the moment, and there's probably about 30, 40 boys down here, so they're not put off by what you're giving them. No, I think the boys know, they can see the, see the benefits as much as uh, they maybe don't like it at the time and don't like me at the time. After the session, they're always quite grateful of it, and uh, the boys, we've got a, an open policy here where the boys will give us feedback, and if they want little changes, it's, it's not a problem. We, we want to target at what the players need. That's a big thing down here, yeah. And what about ambitions for uh, Reaver Performance? What, what are you looking to do to develop it? Um, so I would just like to keep getting the name out there. Um, before Christmas and before the, the latest lockdown, I'd, I'd been uh, visiting other clubs. I'd like to keep doing that just to make more people aware of me. Um, and then just want to be able to help as many rugby players as possible, uh, to be honest, yeah. And is it just rugby or is it other sports as well? Uh, so no, I've, not, yes, I've, I've decided now just to focus on rugby. So originally I was kind of targeting everyone where I realised my speciality and my expertise is in rugby. So that, that's the route I'm going down, just rugby now. Yeah. Dave Cowan, and uh, good to see him uh, putting Hoik through their paces as well. And Scott, you know uh, Dave Cowan a, a wee bit, Henry, and I'm sure some of the, the Selkirk lads have, uh, have uh, endured the pain of a David Cowan session. Yeah, I think a couple of the young boys at the club, um, they're now using his programmes on a monthly basis. So, same again, you know, a local man doing well when COVID strikes, you know, and he worked from home, he worked on one-to-one -one tutoring from home. But now I think things are opening up, he's now able to catch in with them on a one-to-one -one basis and I do know he actually sponsors Clark Young so he sponsors Clark Young as a player um, here at Selkirk and you know you can see the work that obviously Clark's put in in the last few weeks in terms of development to his game as well so yeah it comes with a good repertoire. Absolutely and, and what about uh, the Selkirk setup when it comes to fitness as well uh, how, how do you kind of 
uh, put the, the guys through their paces? Uh, to be honest, Darren Clapperton's actually came back involved in pre-season there, you know, and he kind of, he seems to be reveling in it. So, you know, we felt it was important to kind of involve ex-players or try and get, a, you know, a good buzz about from older players that have been about the club. So, Clappy's actually came on board in the coaching setup. So, he takes the warm-ups on a Saturday, comes down, he does the conditioning. And, you know, we've got our excellent wee coaching group here at Selkirk. So, Clappy kind of takes a lead on it, but the kind of coaches discuss in terms of who needs what and how and how and what we do through the week. Because Ross, uh, whilst the COVID uh, situation was was on, um, it was all about you know getting fit and training and training and training, and there was just no light at the end of the tunnel at all. And these guys come down on a Tuesday and Thursday, and they do it because they want to play on the Saturday. So how difficult was it to to keep morale up and keep everyone together? Um, that first time we came back after the lockdown, it'd be August or whatnot. That was uh, that was hard going. Like, I mean, we weren't able to uh, train out with your bubble, and I think we're in what, groups of five. And at times, you're looking at maybe training with two people at a time, and no balls are allowed either. It's just running up and down the pitch, and that wore on. It got tough. Like, but then obviously it shut down again, and that kind of went to waste. And we came back to start this season, and uh, yeah, it's been good because it's been pretty obvious to start of the season we're going to get something like the second shot of it. So like you were actually training towards the game and uh, it was hard to start with but again we've uh, we got through it and now we're just kind of looking towards like making our team runs and stuff what and working on that and uh, we're just kind of chipping away at bits and pieces at a time now. It's not as full on as it was but the boys, as you say, the boys they want to play rugby again so they know it has to be done and they get on with it and it works out all right, like it's been good. Does it feel almost like normality again? Aye, uh, it does. Like we're, uh, It's been pretty good. We're not in the change rooms and that yet, but apart from that, it's more or less back to normal. Like We're getting on fine. Obviously, we take our precautions and whatnot, but it's, uh, yeah, it's good. Just to get out with the boys and have a laugh and just play some rugby, it's been good. And what about injuries? Um, we'll talk about you personally, first of all, because you've had so many injuries. Yeah. You're, you're probably catching Craig Jackson up of, over at Melrose. I mean, you've certainly had your fair share, that's for sure. But you still, you know, dust yourself off and you keep going. Yeah, I keep going. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not dusted off. Like. <laughs> I'm always carrying something. Like, but it's, uh, no, I love it. Like, so that's it's more or less why I keep doing it. My missus doesn't agree. Like, but uh, no, it's, uh, it's, just, it's a hobby, isn't it? So... These things come part and parcel of rugby, you just got to crack on with it. So how old are you now? 33. 33, so still yeah. a couple of years left in you, yeah? Uh, a couple of years left, I no problem <laughs> at all. What about David Cassidy? Because he's still an example to everyone, isn't he? He's turning out for the A-team and, and still giving a, a good shift. I don't know about an example. He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's still kicking about and whatnot. But no, no, but he is good for the boys, because like, yeah, he's turning 40 this year. And he's, uh, he's still probably one of the main guys in the seconds. and that. He could, If needs must, he could probably do a job with the ones as well, like. Is uh is is well, he's reasonably fit, but he keeps cracking on like. Uh. Hey, some guy, that's for sure. Now, Scott, uh, this is your second season, of course, uh, with Selkirk, and uh, you did pretty well first time round. How are you enjoying it, uh, sort of post COVID? No, look, it's the same again. I mean, it's came with it's came with its difficulties. Certainly, the first time round, you know, we had to split everybody into three pitches, have them in small groups of five, as Ross says. So, I mean, it took a fair bit of coordinating, to be honest. Um, now. As Russ was just saying, we're now back to kind of nor more, more normality. Um, we're cutting out the changing rooms on a Tuesday and Thursday just to minimise internal contact. Um, so boys will turn up on a Tuesday with their boots on, ready to go. So train first and seconds together majority of the time, but it's just, you know, we're probably struggling for a consistency in selection at the moment in terms of, look, pre-season wasn't ideal. We got dealt the COVID blow. We had to pull out the sevens. Uh, we played Melrose, we played Kelso, but it was more a first seconds mix. Um, we're supposed to play Musselburgh, just purely as a first 15 pre season friendly kick on into Jed. We had to cancel that due to COVID and front row crisis. Um, and then we were going to go into Jed. Jed then had COVID. So we ended up at Musselburgh there just two weeks past Saturday. And, you know, we were a wee bit rusty, but to come away with a bonus point is fantastic. But this will probably be the third week on the bounce now that we're going to have uh, five or six changes again. Um, so, you know, we're just really struggling for that consistency point of view. But I think that's the reality of rugby and guys are getting back to the niggles, they're getting back to the bumps. But, 
you know, the bumps are a wee bit more severe on Saturday. You know, we've had a dislocated shoulder, we've had two knees. So, you know, we're probably talking months rather than weeks. We've uh, already lost, uh, I've already lost uh, Adam McComb against Kelso to a dislocated shoulder. So he's out for a few months as well. So, you know, the injuries that we're talking about, you know, they're kind of eight, 12 weeks kind of, um, injuries, so you know it's about the guys being galvanised, getting obviously the seconds on board and trying encouraging people. But I mean, we're up at probably 42, 43 boys most Tuesday, Thursdays. So um, you know, there's plenty, there's plenty of depth in terms of you know. But it's up to these guys that potentially do get opportunities in the first to grab it by both hands and you know be a mainstay. So there's always headaches with injuries and things like that going on in the background. But uh, in general terms, um, you're you're very comfortable being a head coach. No, look, I'll, you know, you know, there's nothing like playing, and you know, the reality is coming back to muscle brand standing on a touchline. You know, there's nothing worse, you know, because you've got absolutely no control over the over what you're doing. Your kind of job is done on the Tuesday and Thursday, and you hope that the players then take your messages on. And you've got no influence until you know maybe the water boy runs on with a message. But when players are in the heat of the battle, whereas you know, as a player, I would say it's probably actually easier being a player. On the pitch, uh, you know, you can make decisions, you can change the kind of momentum of the game. But the reality is, look, I love it. It's the best of kind of both worlds at the moment. I've got a really good job. I've got obviously the rugby on a Tuesday, a Thursday and a Saturday. And then I've obviously got kids activities in with that as well. But, you know, I love coming across here on a Tuesday and a Thursday. And I love, I love competition. Eh? I love winning. I love the mentality <laughs> of it. And, you know, I'm trying to breed that into the boys at Selkirk as much as possible. And, you know, I didn't like getting beat. And, you know, that's just part of the competition and part of the person I am. And, you know, that's why I've taken on the role again to get that buzz about it. Well, uh, buzz about the place. And you must be tempted to, to put yourself on the bench at least sometimes. It's getting, it's getting closer, Stuart, believe you me. <laughs> <laughs> it is getting closer. Um, I, well, I actually sat on the bench a couple of times the first season I was in, so I am registered as a player, but you know I'm a couple of years older than Lincoln Ross and I've not played in a lot. I've been retired since 2017. But now, you're very, so. very fit. I mean, we, we just saw the uh, oh. you know the challenge that you did, the coast-to-coast -coast one. It's totally and, uh, different. <laughs> it's not physical. <laughs> Um, no, look, I would, you know, I would, no, I'm not, no, I'm not even going to come and play it. I mean, you know, but things are, you know, things are getting a wee bit concerning at the moment in terms of back, back players available. You know, we'll probably only go with one on the bench on Saturday just due to probably the actual number of backs in terms of aye, boys kicking about. So, I mean, we're getting stretched as a squad, um, but look, boys all blinking suck it up and get on with it and you know that's the kind of resolute and the kind of dying the fighting attitude that boys have got you know everybody knows we're in the same case and you know I'm sure if one of the well look at Andrew Grant Sutty for instance you know he started at 12 the first week he's went number 8 because Ewan got married on Saturday and the likelihood is he might come into the back line but he's actually one of the guys that's struggling with injury so you know he might have the week off again so you know people have just got to be flexible with it and you know Covid's probably going to come Every club is going to be in the same boat, you know, and it's just a case of boys mucking in and getting on with it. Well, let's reflect just for a few moments on what was a wonderful playing career for you. Um, wonderful achievements, obviously at Melrose as well. You won the Melrose Sevens, you won numerous promotions, championships, Scottish Cups as well. And then from that, you were playing for Scottish club international side. You were also uh, playing for the Scotland Sevens, captaining the Sevens as well. And uh, two particular times where you were the first in a Scottish jersey to beat New Zealand. It was at Sevens, but you beat huh. them. And, and of course, you won the Sevens at Twickenham. Uh, two fantastic achievements. Ah, pretty special. I mean, you know, to say, you know, to have that kind of accolade behind you and, you know, what, rugby 112 years, I think Scotland's played New Zealand, to say across any male, female, rugby, any type, to be the only team and the manner that probably the character, you know, that was the character, you know, we're a close-knit group. There was only a small number of us that were contracted obviously aided by the two or three guys that kind of came in from Glasgow and Edinburgh but you know we're a really close knit group you know we're 21 nil down at half time believe it or not and uh, the Scotland know, way that is ah, exactly you never want to be a Scotland fan we never do it easy do we um, you know and you look at then 21 nil down against New Zealand Scotland never beaten them before you know years gone by would they just crumbled and you know it would have been 40 30 40 points um, but 
you know, we tweaked a wee couple of things at half time and, you know, we got a try up and then we scored 24 unanswered points in the second half. And, you know, we came back probably last play of the game again. So 24-21 in a quarter final against New Zealand, it's, uh, it's definitely one of the, the most special days in a rugby field. No doubt about that. And they can never take that away from you. Never. <laughs> what about winning, though, at, at the England Sevens? That was in, what, 2016? 2016 and 2017. So 2016, similar kind of scenario again. I mean, you know, the commentary there of Scott Hastings and Nyon and Possible in a minute 15 on the clock left and what was it 24, 15 maybe at the time, uh, nine points behind and same again. I mean, you know, we worked on things and I think a lot of that goes unnoticed. You know, we had a really successful week in Paris the week before. You know, we had won five out of the six games and been beaten the final. So we'd been really competitive the week before. And, you know, you brought in a couple of guys with a huge amount of energy in terms of Damien Hoyland and George Hornan around the squad at the time, you know, and they brought a lot of energy to the squad and added to that. And, you know, on the day, it was just more about enjoyment, people being in a decent culture and having a laugh with your mates and you know that paid dividends in the end and you know the way and the mannerisms that we finished that final to play right to the whistle and you know thankful it was the last ever 10 minute final or it wouldn't have been so you know that was the last ever time there was a 10 minute final at Twickenham as well so we used it and we needed every second of it um, and you know to come back and score two late tries through Doogie Fife it's kind of you know as you say it's stuff kind of dreams are made of so um, to I lift a trophy in a Scotland jersey and be able to sing your national anthem in a final was aye, very, very special. What would you put at the top for, from all your achievements? Is it the New Zealand? <sighs> no, nah, I think winning. I think winning. I mean, obviously, yes, you've won and you've beat New Zealand, but I think being that first team, Scottish national team to win an IRB event, especially probably you look at the players, probably the budget, and where it was as well, you know, down in Twickenham, uh, I think, look, that's got to be up there. Being South Africa in the final in 2016 when no other Scotland team have done that to lift the first IRB event was pretty special. Mm. Not a bad career, Scott. Not, Not bad. a bad career. And what about you, Ross? Not a bad career and it's still going. And uh, what about your own highlights? Quite a few sevens uh, victories, of course. Yeah, we're probably looking at the sevens as the, the main things for us. But, uh, one motion... To Prem won a few years ago and beaten in that year in the league as well. That was the that Invincibles was under Peter Wright. Yeah, no, yep. that was good. Like um, we lost it in the last game of the season as well, but uh, we scraped that one as well. But I'm uh, probably looking at the sevens. We've done pretty well here at Selkirk sevens, especially. We've won probably five or so when during my career here. Like and uh, I, it comes to the sevens and the boys, especially down here, they really look forward to it. I know it's kind of different than other clubs and that. It's maybe not such a highlight, but get to the end of the season, the boys are ready to go for it and. Uh, it kind of shown that how well we've done, considering we've beaten some some pretty good teams to get those titles. Like now, I don't think you were involved in the the the, the time you did the hat trick, two thousand seven, eight, and nine, or were yeah, you? Yeah, I was kicking about there. Oh, well. you were yeah, yeah. okay, but certainly two thousand eleven, two thousand thirteen, and two thousand eighteen, you were very much involved in the the whole setup of the clubs and 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 to win your own sevens, um, particularly one. I think it was a two thousand thirteen against Melrose. That was uh, that was some achievement. Yeah, that was right down to the whistle again as well. I think that we can, we were, we were I can't remember what we were down a point. I think, were you playing that day? I don't know. Nah. No. <laughs> Couldn't possibly Definitely have been not. him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the footage out though. We will nah, find out if he was on the pitch. I don't think he was, but that came to the last, uh, last play of the game. We beat him then. But I mean, they've beaten us here a few times in the final as well. So it's, uh, it's kind of tit for tat with Melrose at Selkirk Lake. Two great examples sitting right next to you now of success stories by individuals from the borders. Yeah, definitely. Like I've, I've first of all, I've played against uh, Ross quite a lot um, during my time. We're sort of quite often similar um, positions. And he's always a very difficult player to play against. I've, and I've, as I've watched him when I've started doing the commentary, I think he's got a lot, lot better. You know, he br brings a lot of experience. He brings a lot of direct running, good skill set, good leadership to Selkirk, and he kind of epitomises what. I think the culture in Selkirk is it's a really good close knit group of guys. You know, you see them they're all they're all mates on and off the field and I think it's a it's a really good club. I think if you know if I if I had my playing days again and I was a young guy I would probably look at coming to a club like Selkirk to try and play and better myself. Um, but you can't go back on stuff like that anyway. But he certainly was always a, a very good player and, and, and had a lot of success here as well. And Scott, I remember when I was um like playing district um young as a youngster and I used to see Scott kicking on the green yards or in the back pitches and I didn't really know who he was at the time 
um, but he was always there just kicking balls and then when I started playing against him I realised you know maybe practice does work you know so <laughs> he's, um, he's, he's enjoyed a, great, a lot of great success and even just speaking to them there the, a lot of their highlights are Sevens rugby and you know from, from a lot of Borders players we're, we kind of breed a lot of uh, good Sevens players down here and it's, it's great to see that they've, you know, they've both enjoyed really good careers obviously uh, Ross is still going um, he's only a year older than me but I've been retired eight years but he's still going and I think Scott will um, he'll enjoy a really good coaching career he's driven you can hear he, he likes to win things as well so he's got all the attributes to be a, a top coach and of course we must mention as well we're talking about success your own success that t- famous time which we showed in I think the first programme which was uh, when you won the Peebles Sevens at Peebles and you were captaining them and uh, that was uh, the first one for a long long time that must be your highlight yeah oh definitely I won, I won a raffle at Haddington away one uh, <laughs> no definitely <laughs> You know, sevens. That was that was definitely the highlight. It was something that I wanted to do since I was younger. Is is not only captain people's, but win a win a win a trophy of some sort. So we had promotions and relegations, but you know, I think there's. I've enjoyed I've enjoyed I enjoyed playing rugby as a as a kid. I think it, it brings so much to you. It develops you so well in, in terms of the people you meet and, and the way it kind of brings you up. So, but definitely for me, it was it was sevens as well. Yeah, I loved it. Well, we're coming towards the end of the programme now, so we have to have a quick, uh, brief look ahead at uh, what's in store uh, for this week. We've obviously got the Southern Knights on uh, Friday night, tomorrow night, uh, playing at home to Heriots, and on paper, that one should be uh, one which they, they should get all points from. Yeah, I think Heriots have um, kind of flattered to the deceive this season in the Super 6, not really um, been able to put a marker down in the tournament at all. Um, so on paper, you would imagine Southern Knights would be heavy favourites going into that. But these are the games that, you know, at that level, at the semi-pro level, you, you, you need to turn up, you still need to perform. We spoke about respect at the, the start of the you know, the start of the programme and, and the Southern Knights will have to give Heriots an, an amount of respect if they're going to be, continue to put in the performances they have been because they're the, they are the games that can maybe derail your, your title aspirations. Now, Ross and uh, Scott, obviously looking at a home win uh, at Philip Och on Saturday. Uh, what's your own thoughts as a neutral? Uh, I think, you know, listening to, I, I think on paper, you'd, you'd have to go with Curry. Um, sorry, but you'd have to go with Curry. They've got their own, they've got their injury issues um, at Selkirk. But I've played against Selkirk for years. I know, I know what they're like as a team. Um, so the game's not won on paper, and especially at Philip Och, I've seen loads of games where teams come down expecting to you know, beat a team with a soft underbelly because they've lost a couple of players and they get turned over. So, you know, on paper you would go Curry, but the game's not won on paper, so I'm going to have to be slightly diplomatic there so I didn't get beat up as I leave the ground. <laughs> OK, Aberdeen Grammar against Jed Forrest. Jed Forrest uh, haven't got any wins at the moment. Aberdeen the same. Aberdeen not looking particularly great, but it is at Ruby's Law. And uh, we know the last time, or one of the last times Jed Forrest visited them came, came back with a 60-point defeat. Um, they're really up against it. It's a long trip up there and they have to perform. Yeah, I think they're the sort of games that you've got to target to win for Jed now. I think if they're in the same position down at the bottom of the table, you've got to go up there and, and put in a performance and win. They've obviously had a narrow defeat last week um, and they'll want to try and get you know some momentum in their, in their league season. And that's the sort of game that you need to target. You need to keep those teams that are struggling as well. You need to keep them at an arm's length, push them down at the opportunities you get. And Jed will be hoping to go up there. It's Ruby's a difficult place to go for, for any team. You know, the Aberdeen have been up and down in, in Scottish club rugby for the last few years. In any league that they're in, it's a difficult place to travel. And especially, you know, Jed, will, they'll find it difficult. But, you know, they've got the players capable, if, they, if it's a nice dry day, that they can, they can certainly stretch Aberdeen. And, and they'll be hoping to pick up a win. But they're the games they need to target. In brackets against Hoyk. In brackets have been surprising. I thought they were going to be quite poor this season, and I was wrong. Um, so, you know, Hoyk have, I think, a narrow win against Selkirk. They've obviously they defeated Curry in, in the opening game of the season, but they have been defeated. It's going to be a, a difficult one. You know, going off form, you would say if Edin Brackies are at home, you would you would imagine that going off form, Hoyk have been defeated on the road this season. So it's going to be a difficult one. I think the first few episodes of this, you were, you know, there wasn't a lot of form to go for. You were always maybe just swaying towards the border team because you had a bit of an allegiance to them. But you know, for this one, you'd probably say Edin Brackies start that one just kind of marginal favourites. International one, the only team to have a home tie is Kelso, and uh, they will be looking to bounce back from Gala. They've got Sterling Wolves. Yes, yeah, Sterling again have been have been reasonably poor this season. I think Kelso had a really good start. You know, two wins from two, and then they went down to um, well, they went to Netherdale, got defeated. But I was quite impressed with the way Kelso came back into it. I think first half they maybe didn't perform the way that they had this season. 
I mean, when they did come back in, you've seen the influence of likes of Bruce McNeil, um, uh, certainly, you know, Frankie Robson, that was a really good partnership. They're kind of 8 and 12, they were really linking well together. And you'd imagine that if they can really get, you know, stamp their authority on the game early, because they started really late in that game, they would be, they'd be too much for Sterling. Melrose go to Watsonians now. They've already won away uh, against Boroughmuir. So they've got two uh, city teams under their belt already and they're, they're, they want a third. Yeah, definitely. I think they, they've, they've started well. We, we spoke about it before and, and, and how... You know, I, was, I was almost slightly surprised at how Melrose have been as well, but they've started really strong, good results. They're, they're getting that winning mentality and that winning culture, which we've seen for years from Melrose teams anyway. Um, so you would imagine that they'll, you know, they'll be going through there. They're focused. They're a Melrose team. They'll know what job they've got to do. Um, and I, I would say they'd, they'd probably be the favourites in that tie. And Gala visiting Golden Acre to play Heriot's Blues. Again, another winnable game for Gala. I think um, Heriot's obviously getting defeated by Melrose, which are the games that we can probably gauge them off because we can we, we know where they are. So Gala, you know, good win at home. They'll be wanting to try and get a bit of momentum because, you know, that win, uh, the, the loss away to Ayr at Milbrae is probably hurting them a bit because they were certainly in that game and let it slip. So they'll be certainly want to try and get, you know, again, build off the back of a win against Kelso and try and get some momentum in the league campaign because you need to build momentum in these leagues, you know, if you're going to, you're going to kind of mount any sort of challenge. Huge game in National 2 for Peebles. They take on the league leaders unbeaten and that is uh, Newton Stewart. Yeah, again, a difficult one to try and gauge. Uh, Peebles, again, losing a, a couple of players and I got some injuries. They've welcomed back uh, Scott Stoddart on the wing, who's, I think, a player that they perhaps missed. They did miss um, somebody with a bit of raw pace um, on the outside. I think they, they, it gives them, a, especially when they're rebalancing their squad, when they've got Donald Anderson going into 10, Davy Collins is playing really well at 9. They've got, they've got a lot of good young players, I think, they're similar in, in ways to Selkirk, but maybe just a level down, if you know what I mean. They're, they've got a lot, of, a lot of good local young talent coming through. And they'll want to kind of build off where they left off a few seasons ago because they were really challenging at the top of that league. And I think for a team like Peebles, with the size it's got and the rugby culture it has now, I think they should really be aiming to be a, a league or two above because they've certainly got the capabilities. They just need to tie it all together. So they'll be hoping that's a, a big game for them. Um, but if they get the win, it will really put down a marker for their season. And Berwick have Perthshire at home. They're <laughs> at Berwick are above them at the moment in the table. That's certainly one they'll be targeting as a, a home win. Yeah, they, they, especially after you know the, the, the last few weeks that they've had. They've had a bit of a roller coaster with cancelled games and you know not, not being able to really hit the ground running. But that's, again, Scremerston is a very difficult place to travel for, for teams. Berwick are perhaps another team that have been up and down the last few seasons and they'll be look, trying to get a win against a team who'll be equally wanting to do that. It's a league campaign. You can't, you, can't, um, you can't let all these games slip through your fingers because it ends up halfway through the season. You've, you've got a, a games of nothingness. So certainly Berwick will be wanting to try and get a win at Scremerston. And into the East League briefly, we've got uh, Duns at home to Portobello. Again, they'll be wanting to bounce back on that one. Uh, the only derby this weekend is in uh, Division 2, and that's Langham against Hoyt Lindine, which we mentioned a little bit earlier. And then uh, Earlston looking to bounce back. They've got a tricky trip to Edinburgh Northern as well. So that's what's happening in the East League. And of course, there's uh, plenty going on in the East Reserves 1 and 2 and the Semi Junior as well. And you can see on the screen at the moment plenty of of, uh, fixtures for you to go and enjoy over the weekend and then uh, briefly on Sunday uh, the Kelso ladies will go and visit Stuart Tree who are a very tough side to beat yeah and I think you know going off the back of their their first win it's you know probably a bit repetitive but in a league campaign you want to build off the back of wins and, and Kelso ladies are finding their feet at that level but you know there's no better way than doing that than getting a good win against an air team getting on the road and trying to build that that culture with that winning culture in that team and you know, you've, they don't, you don't enter a league campaign so that you can win every game against easy teams. You, you challenge yourself. That's why, that's why Ross is still playing, because he wants to challenge himself against the best players in Scotland at the moment and see what level he's at. And that's exactly what the Kelso lady It doesn't matter if it's male or female rugby. Whatever level, you, you do it because you want a nice competitive tie to see where your ability is at. So it's going to be a difficult game for Kelso ladies, but they'll, they'll certainly be looking to try and build off the back of a good win that they got at home last week. So, a packed weekend of rugby in prospect. Of course, our commentary match will be down here. Stuart McFarlane calling that one, and it's Selkirk against Curry. But I'd like to thank uh, Ross Nixon, of course, and Scott White and uh, Dale Clancy for being with us here at Philip Hoch. Next week, we're going to go to Pointer Park and uh, meet our friends at Kelso. But for now, thanks so much indeed for listening and watching, and bye for now. Mm -hmm.